Ladies and gentlemen, your final speaker here tonight. Uh, he is our anchor tonight. Our final speaker is a professor of economics and holds the Joseph P. Ferry Chair in Public Policy at College of St. Benedict St. John's University. He earned his BS at the University of Minnesota and his MA and PhD in economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Mr. Lewis Johnston writes a regular column on economics and the economy for the MinnesotaPost.com called Macro Micro Minnesota, and he is a regular guest. I'm sure you've heard him. I have on Minnesota Public Radio and WCCO Radio. He strives to separate the sense from the nonsense in economic policy, which is so difficult to do sometimes, and his discussion in his discussions, and he does so in my opinion, magnificently. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Lewis Johnston, everybody. Well, I'm tempted to simply say good night, everybody, and walk off the stage. But Casey and a number of other people have talked about this little device here, so I'll start with that, cell phones. Until recently, if you wanted to send a text or do anything, you had to use a keyboard on there that looked a lot like this one. And notice in the upper left hand corner it says QWERTY. Okay, go ahead. They wouldn't let me have the clicker. I mean, my God. <laughs> it looks like this. It's a typewriter. How many of you learned how to use a typewriter? I'm one of the last dying breed who actually used typewriters. All right. A lot of you probably know the story of why typewriters have this kind of keyboard. It has to do with their design. They have little hammers in them. There's gonna be a slide coming up, look at that. Um, that hit pieces of paper through a ribbon that contains some ink on it. Now, in the late 1860s, in the 1870s, and through the 1880s, a variety of different kinds of technologies for doing this kind of work were developed. They all had one problem, however. When you started to get really good at typing, these hammers would do that. <coughs> They'd start smashing together. And so, pretty soon, some pretty clever inventors in a place called Dayton, Ohio, started thinking about how could we keep this from happening? And they realized, let's start putting the letters in a particular order so that when you strike them, Q rarely comes next to W. And E sometimes comes next to R, but usually, E then R or R then E, it doesn't matter. They're not gonna get smashed together. But yet, look at this. We're still using this darn thing on our cell phones. What the heck's going on here? Well, that's the story that I wanna tell you tonight. The story that I wanna tell you tonight is that history matters. Where you start ends up affecting where you end up. Now we act a lot in the US and a lot of other places as if markets and all kinds of things like that just come to some beautiful equilibrium and we end up in the right place at the right time and there's this invisible hand. Well, I'm here to tell you that ain't true. In particular, we've got something that I like to call either quirtynomics or sometimes, this will come here, path dependence is the fancy word for it, but the phrase as I said that I like is history matters. So let me tell you another story. Not a technological story, because we could tell lots of technological stories like the QWERTY keyboard. We could talk about VHS versus beta. That'll age some of you, right? Um, we could talk about all kinds of different things like that, but I want to talk about public policy for a moment. So lately, there's been a lot of talk about this little thing called healthcare. Back in the 1930s, a number of hospitals, including those in, a number in Minnesota, came up with the idea of prepaid hospital care. Pay a small fee per month, and then if you needed to go to the hospital, it was covered. And this famous poster was made by an immigrant from Sweden, and it had a blue cross on it, and that actually ended up becoming the name, Blue Cross. And in addition, people came up with a similar system called Blue Shield for prepaid doctor care. There's supposed to be another slide there. Oh, okay. Um, well, okay, that's taking place in the 30s. We all know that World War II begins in Europe in 1939 and on December 7th, 1941 in the United States. The United States gears up for war, total war, total production. 
And everyone, men, women, older people, younger people, are all drawn into the labor force. How do you get people to move from one company to another if you find out they're really good? Well, you usually offer them a higher wage. Well, look at that slide on the right. One of the things we did during World War II was created price controls. So how do you get somebody to move to your company if you can't offer them a higher wage? Well, some enterprising people, again, in Ohio, near Dayton, not actually in there, came up with the idea, hey, what if we paid your Blue Cross for you? Or if you don't have Blue Cross, why don't I get it for you? We'll cover it. Well, you can imagine there were a lot of companies that looked at this and said, wait a minute, you're cheating. You can't do that. So they took the idea to the War Production Board, and the War Production Board said, yeah, why not? Go ahead. You want to give people Blue Cross Blue Shield and health insurance? Go ahead. You want to give them pensions? Go ahead. And so that's when we start getting employer-provided health insurance and employer-provided pensions. Well, probably know why I got this slide up here. The war ends and we get this thing that we've come to know as the baby boom and the great growth spurt that we get between the late 1940s and the early 1970s. One of the things that underlay all of that was tremendous growth in the economy, large corporate profits. How do you get people to move from one company to another or to stay loyal to your company? Wow, how about offering them benefits packages? Offer them Blue Cross Blue Shield. Here's a display from Minneapolis Moline Tractor Company in the early 1950s. Sign up for Blue Cross Blue Shield and we'll pay 90% of the fee if you stay and work at our company. So the idea started to spread. And again, just like during the war, there was a lot of controversy about it. A lot of companies said, wait a minute, this isn't fair. Um, you know, and a lot of things we give, we can deduct from our costs. Can we do that with our health care? Well, the Internal Revenue Service, which is usually some place that plays somebody that plays a villain in most of our stories, is the good guy here, in a way. They rule in 1954, sure, you want to give your, your uh, employer employees health care? Deduct the whole cost. Go ahead. You can deduct it as a business expense. So from 1954 onward, this idea of providing health care through your employer just explodes in the United States. So here's a billboard. I chose this because this was on a building here at 8th and Hennepin, here in downtown Minneapolis, promoting the idea that your company, too, could, uh, could participate in this wonderful thing of Blue Cross and Blue Shield for your employers. And in fact, you don't even have to get it through your employer. You could buy it for yourself. Go out and buy a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. My grandfather did this. He had a mink ranch and a commercial fishing operation. Bought Blue Cross Blue Shield for himself. And the ball continued to roll through the 50s and 60s, and this thing exploded, and it went from being a small part of a relatively large industry, the insurance industry, to being today almost 20% of the American economy when we think about healthcare. And technology was driven in part by this expansion of healthcare because you had to keep track of all this stuff. So here I've got a picture, one of the first computers that's installed at Blue Cross Blue Shield Minnesota in 1960. But notice that keyboard the guy was sitting at looks an awful lot like that one. <laughs> And that's my point. We just got through a bloody debate. Depending on how you count it, it was seven years long on health care. Why does the health care system look the way it does in the United States? It's historical accident. History matters. It's not because employer provided health care was the best way to go. It's like the typewriter keyboard. It's what we were used to. It's like having QWERTY on our cell phones. Why are we doing this? Well, because people know how to use employer-provided health care. They're used to it. It's the way things have always been, so let's just keep it that way. Well, like Casey pointed out with um, being able to use voice control, we don't have to use keyboards anymore. And we don't have to do that with health care. And my argument is that we need to think about the economy and we need to think about public policy by keeping these things in mind. 
the way things are aren't necessarily the best. They suffer from quartinomics. They suffer from the fact that they're path dependent. In fact, what ultimately matters is history. Thank you very much. <laughs>